All right. Hello and welcome to Around the Horns, the show where we are talking about the University of Texas baseball program. Zach, that is the Big 12 champion University of Texas baseball program. Of course, we are going to be talking about the series, uh, the sweep of West Virginia, everything that went into that, all the reactions. Um, we're going to be talking about potentially hosting a regional. We've got all kinds of RPI stuff. We've got projections coming out. We're going to be previewing the Big 12 tournament. We're going to be talking about all kinds of stuff. Um, Zach, my co-host, is here once again. How are we feeling? Uh, how, how are you feeling as a Big 12 champ? Uh, elated. And, uh, you know, I think it was buried last time, but 56 games in, nailed it. I had projected 38 and 18. Texas needed a sweep going in, and they they did me a solid, so nailed it. <laughs> yep. You hit the nail right on the head. I I, ended, I was one game lower than you, so two, two out of three, and I would have gotten it. But happy you got it. Happy it worked out the way it did. Um, just a really fun weekend at the Dish. I mean, there was a lot of good stuff going on. It was awesome to see the players be able to celebrate after the win on Saturday. But, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, let's just start with Thursday. Zach, the main thing I want to point out is – this series started before the series started. When we got the email and the notification of the pitching rotation, we, we started talking to each other. We were like, all right, this is interesting because West Virginia, we talked about on the show last week. I mean, their, their Friday night, their game one guy all year had been Ben Hampton. He, he didn't go that many pitches against Texas Tech the week before. And then the rotation comes out and West Virginia decided not to go with Ben Hampton in game one. We never got like a concrete reason. Of course, West Virginia wasn't going to give that out. He didn't seem to be hurt um, when he did pitch. Eventually, he didn't look great. So who knows exactly what's going on with him. But Zach, the one thing I can tell you for sure, Texas noticed. Texas took offense to it, and it motivated them. Because, I mean, they said it. You could just tell all weekend, just talking to them after the Thursday win, then after the Friday win, then after the Saturday win. It kept coming up. And uh, that was where the series really started for me. And then... Of course, Texas uh, had a lot of first and second inning runs all year. They were able to jump on the starters. But Thursday, 12-2 to two win. Lucas Gordon was awesome. Uh, where do you want to start with that Thursday game? Yeah, I think you nailed it, right? West Virginia, Coach Maisie, whether rightly or wrongly, decided to pitch backwards and started a true freshman on the mound who had not thrown more than, what, four innings all year long. His prior start against at Pitt, he gave up seven runs and five run seven hits and five runs in those four innings. I to me, that was very, very um, interesting considering West Virginia has never fished, finished higher than fourth. This would be like they're locked in They're You know, they're going to finish their highest. They only need one win to get a championship. And to me, you go win it, right? You, th you throw your ace, you go win the damn thing, and then you let the chips fall where they are. Yeah, uh, Gordon, as you mentioned, was really, really good. Uh, the Texas hitters were not happy. And they, they continued right where they left off against San Jose State, and they were just absolutely blasting the ball from the get-go. Uh, Jared Thomas led off, and it was like, okay, here we go. <laughs> yeah, it was awesome all weekend. I mean, when you, when you start to mess with the rotation like that, it just it sends the wrong message sometimes, especially in college sports where momentum is so important, you know, mentality is so important, motivation is so important. All these little things. I mean, these are young kids. Like it, it, it can throw them off. It can motivate them. You just, you never want to play with fire that much. And it felt like they were playing with fire. And, you know, it's just one of those series. Texas knew they needed a sweep. So if Texas has a better chance to win game one, once they win game one, they're starting to feel a little bit dangerous. They know they have LeBaron Johnson Jr. on the mound game two. You win game two, you start to feel really dangerous. Like you start to feel like you've got all the momentum. It's just, it's a dangerous game to play. I mean, when we got the, of course, uh, we both picked them to lose the series last weekend, but then I'm not going to lie. When I, when I got the, when I saw the rotation, I was like, okay, this has potential to be pretty interesting. And uh, it, it, I'm not that shocked of how it worked out, but uh, yeah, I mean, Lucas Gordon, he was phenomenal. Seven innings, zero earned eight K's 95 pitches. We talk about it all the time. We've talked about it on the show. It was the inside fastball to the righties. Um, that's the bread and butter for Lucas Gordon. It sets up the outside changeup. It sets off, um, you know, the back foot slider when he is able to throw that fastball inside of right-handed hitters, it's going to work out for him. And I could tell right off the bat, that was the game plan. I mean, Gary Guillemette, he was setting up inside of those righties over and over. There was a concerted effort to establish that inside fastball. And then after the game, Lucas Gordon talked, you know, he talked about that exactly, you know, 
it's kind of funny with Gordon too. Like when you talk to these players so many times, you start to notice things early in the year, we're talking to him. He had been struggling a little bit with the changeup. He'd been throwing a lot of sliders and then he came out and he had a game where the changeup was really good. And we asked him about that. And he said, yeah, I'd been focusing too much on my slider and just like been neglecting the change up a little bit. And it, it just kind of had to reinforce that. And then we asked him about the inside fastball after this game. He's like, yeah, I've been working, you know, on my arm side fastball so much, which is outside to righties. You know, I just kind of had to, I'd been neglecting the inside fastball a little bit and I had to get back to it. So it's like, okay, I noticed a pattern here, you know, when he locks in on something and they have a game plan going into the week, he is able to execute. So, I mean, going forward, you have to feel pretty good about where he's at, but yeah, I just think it's funny whenever like you can pick up on that kind of stuff with some of these guys, when you talk to them so many times. Yeah, no doubt. And I mean, Lucas Gordon is the epitome of Cali cool. You know, he's, have you ever thrown him a hitter? I don't know. Maybe, uh, you know, it's just, you never know what you're going to get from him, but you know, sometimes to the, your point, like you get those snippets and you're like, ah, we know exactly what Lucas has been focusing on with Chris Gordon and Woody. We know exactly what he's been tailoring suit. So yeah, that, that was interesting to see. And then um, yeah, you, you know, again, eight Ks, seven innings pitch, zero earned runs. David Pierce talked about it during the media session earlier in the week. He said, you can't sweep if you don't win game one. And Lucas Gordon has always been that guy that all season has said, look, I help set the plate. If I do well, my team does well, we're in for a good weekend. And it's true. Like when he struggled, they've, they've not generally won. And so, um, yeah, I mean, he came out and he, he was Lucas Gordon of Lucas Gordon. That, that was probably a, a really resounding one. I, to me, that's one of his best outings of all year long. Cause he wasn't doing it against a scrub team either. You got JJ Weatherholt hitting 466 on this season. You had Tevin Tucker, who's got a lot of speed and I don't know, first game, second game, third game. What we didn't see is we didn't see West Virginia run. And they've attempted 118 steals on the season. So that's not nothing. Yeah. Weatherholt was, he was only two for 13 on the weekend and he was over three in his at-bats against Lucas Gordon. So we talked about that would obviously be a huge part. Um, if they're able to take him out, that really slows down the offense. And that is what happened. Last thing I want to talk about with Lucas Gordon, um, David Pierce mentioned after the game, he feels like he should be big 12 pitcher of the year. I, I think he's got a good shot. I mean, I was looking at it this morning. If you look at the overall stats um, for the, for the uh, pitchers in the conference, it's, it's going to come down to, in my opinion, I think it's between Lucas Gordon, LeBaron Johnson Jr. And then Braden Carmichael of Oklahoma. And when you compare Gordon to Carmichael, Gordon's got the better ERA and he's got a better ERA in more innings and he's on the better team and he has more strikeouts. Now, if you filter by conference games only, Carmichael has a slightly better ERA. But when you look at the whole season overall, I, I, do, I do think Gordon probably is going to win that award and that is going to be well-deserved because like we talked about, He's just been nails all year. And there were times where, you know, before LBJ really got it going, it felt like there was a ton of pressure on Gordon to win that Friday game. And he came through, you know, way more often than not. So, uh, you know, it, it would be great if he does win that award. And I think he has a pretty good shot at it. Yeah, I think he's got a real good shot. I mean, if you look at the numbers, LBJ has been better in conference. Yeah. Uh, Carmichael's been stupendous in, con you know, Carmichael's 6 0 in conference. But if you look at the overall body of work, um, you know, realistically, the only guy that's kind of been better than Lucas Gordon is Isaac Stevens from from Oklahoma State. And he's a reliever. He's got six saves. But if you look at his conference numbers, they're not what you would think would be pitcher of the year type numbers. Right. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, Coach Pierce probably has it pretty close to right. I think Lucas has got the inside track. Yep. And then uh, one of the guys that will be competing with him, that is LeBaron Johnson Jr. He got the ball on Friday. On Friday, Texas came out again. Um, they were able to pick up the win 10-4. to 4. We talked about Blaine Traxel and how he goes deep into games and how they need to jump on him. Well, they jumped all over him. And, of course, Randy Mazey, uh, you know, he wasn't going to take him out of the game. He was going to throw his 100 pitches. But they tagged him for a lot of runs early. I mean, it was just – it was just the first and second innings all weekend long. It was just let's give these awesome starters, you know, for Texas a cushion to work with. And that helped quite a bit. But – um. You know, LBJ was awesome. Once again, it was hilarious because I was watching in the press box. I'm always taking notes during the game. And, you know, one of my first notes was like, oh, it doesn't really seem like LBJ has his best stuff today. And then I was just like, I was continue to take notes. And I was like, all right, he's got seven strikeouts after three. And I was like, all right, he's got nine strikeouts after four. Okay, he's done. He had 11 strikeouts. Didn't really feel like he had his best stuff, which is just like hilarious because then we talked to LBJ and we talked to David Pierce after the game. 
And of course they both said, yeah, it didn't really seem like LBJ had his best stuff. And it's like, he still had 11 strikeouts and, you know, five and a third against the number six in the country. So that just tells you where he's at, man. I mean, the walks of, you know, they're not really that big of an issue anymore. We'll see if he can keep that up. I mean, he seems pretty dialed in right now. He's feeling really good with the slider right now. I think earlier in the year, he was throwing a lot more splits. I think now he's going a little more slider heavy. I mean, yeah. they look pretty similar, but I mean, he's really conf- he's really confident with that slider right now. He's fooling hitters left and right. Um, it's just, it's an exciting time to have that one-two punch right now. We talked about it all year. No one wants to see the one-two punch of Lucas Gordon and LeBaron Johnson Jr. And, you know, West Virginia can testify on that front because it was, it was not great for the Mountaineers at the plate against those two guys. Yeah, two things I noticed about LBJ um, was – if he could throw that first pitch fastball for a strike, he can come back with a splitter and then immediately come back with a slider. And that slider doesn't have to be in the zone necessarily because that splitter and the, the the slider look almost identical and one just happens to completely fall off the table, right? And so if that splitter is anywhere near the zone, the hitters are having to adjust and then, then trying to adjust to an 87 mile an hour slider. And they were swinging over, they were buckling, they were going to their knees. And yeah, it he didn't have his best stuff. He wasn't able to locate as much, but he was still very good. And the second thing I noticed was uh, the in-game interview with Lucas Gordon, where he was just like gushing over LBJ. He's like, I wish I could have his arm for just one day. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, Lucas, so you know, potential big 12 player of the year. And he's like, I want that arm so badly. <laughs> it was that pretty good about him. it. You got to love him, that guy. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, I mean, you can't blame him. I mean, who wouldn't want to, you know, have the talent and the ability of, of LBJ, but I, uh, you know, aside from the talent and the ability, the other thing that really stood out was it was it was the mental side. I mean, when you have when you are out there and you're able to compete without your best stuff, that's when you know you're a really great pitcher because, you know, any pitcher that has great stuff, if they're on their A game that day, they're going to dominate. But it's the pitchers that can go out there, you know, with their B stuff and their B plus stuff and be able to navigate through jams. And, you know, if you get behind in the count, be able to work back into a count or get a clutch ground ball that's when you know a pitcher has really gotten there. And, you know, the the coaches have talked about this, LBJ. He's just, he's gotten so much better on the mental side. The pressure doesn't get to him. You know, a 3-1 three, a count, he's able to groove that fastball in there for a strike. He gets in the bases loaded jam. He's not going to melt down. He's just, he fields his position better. He controls the running game better. The mental side and the toughness of that guy on the mound is really, you know, that is what has made him in, an elite pitcher in the conference. It's not just, you know, the splitter and the slider and the upper 90s fastball. You know, that is what is kind of taking him over the top for me. Yeah, no doubt. And then from a hitting standpoint, you know, if we don't say Porter Brown's name enough. I yep. mean, what a special day for that guy. He hit three home runs, I believe one to each side of the park. So he went dead center. One left center and one right center, and he it did was... it. He did it in order too. He went, yeah. he went right field, center field, left field. Like it was just like it was like it just. He made it look way too easy, but yeah, yeah. Keep going. <laughs> but uh, you know, eight RBIs, and you know, every time he came up to the plate, you're like, I don't know what he, what does he do now? Like he's already done everything because it wasn't like he was hitting solo bombs either. He hit a couple of three run bombs and a two run bomb, and um, you know, he came up to bat the fourth time around, and everyone had their phones out. They're like, this has never been done at Texas, no one's hit four home runs in a game. Everyone was ready for it. And, you know, unfortunately he didn't, but uh, yeah, you know, they, the TCU folks always that I talk to always say that Porter Brown is known for his month of May. And I, I think we just saw the why, like everyone is so excited about that bat because from the left side, he just, he comes out of nowhere and is just with ease pulling power to 400 feet. So it's, yeah, it was something else to watch. Yeah, I mean, the stuff about Porter being really good in the month of May, that's not surprising to me because he's just such a he's such a hitter. Like, he's such a pure hitter. Like, you have guys that are talented and have a lot of power, and then you have guys that are just hitters. Like, they can roll out of bed at 2 in the morning, and they can, you know, hit a single to the opposite field, or they can pull a double down the line, and that's Porter Brown. So when you think about it, you get into the month of May, Porter Brown has seen every pitch. I mean, he, is, he started every single, pretty much every single game this year and he's seen hard throwing righties, he's seen soft tossing lefties, he's seen every type of fastball, he's seen every type of changeup, he's seen sidearm guys, he's seen over the top guys. I mean, he's had so many at bats and he's a veteran player. When you get to this point in the season, you've just seen everything. Like you get into the box and you are comfortable, you know, now you get into the time of year where you're seeing pitchers for the, you know, possibly the second time, you get deep, you know, you get them second or third time through the order. I mean, 
he just looks so comfortable at the box. And when you get a veteran hitter that just has such good feel, it's not surprising that he's the type of guy that's going to heat up, you know, this late in the season, which man, good news for Texas, because uh, they have quite a few guys that are red hot at the plate right now. And um, that offense, man, it's, it's, it was really fun to watch this weekend. Yeah. And actually we got that backwards, right? Porter Brown hit the three home runs on Thursday on Friday was when Thomas Powell, DC and EK all went yard. So you had, you had the trio, like all th- the, the top three guys are all going yard and multi-hit days. And so, yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I forgot okay. it was the Gordon, Gordon Porter Brown day on Thursday. Yeah. I apologize for messing that up. That is on me, but yeah, I mean, nonetheless, I mean, it all, it all still is apply. It all still applies the same, but yeah, I mean, just incredible stuff. Um, yeah. Then, you know, we roll into the clincher, you know, after the game on Friday, we realized, all right, this is uh, you know, this is the storybook ending that everyone was looking for. Um, you know, Oklahoma state dropped one to Oklahoma. So Texas just had to win to, you know, claim a share of the big 12 title and the number one seed. So, you know, you know, we ended up with three conference champions. Texas, you know, is, is the most conference champion, you know, if that makes sense, because they were the number one seed, but yeah, I mean, it couldn't have lined up any better, right? Tanner Witt coming back from Tommy John, you know, on pitching on the mound on Saturday um, with the conference title on the line and, he came through, you know, I don't think people should be that surprised. Yeah. He's had his troubles here and there, but he went out there three innings, zero runs, got out of a jam in the third inning, 44 pitches. So his pitch count continues to trend up. It didn't spike by a crazy amount, but you know, it made sense to probably get him out of there after the third inning. He was at 44 pitches. He got out of a jam. That was kind of a clean time to go to the bullpen, but it was just so cool how it set up going into Saturday with Tanner Wood on the mound. And then to see him come through, that was a, uh, that was pretty cool stuff. Yeah. And, you know, it was also funny because Friday night, I mean, I felt like the game hadn't even ended yet. And West Virginia's like, yeah, we're going to Ben Hampton. We're going to our ace on, on Saturday. <laughs> yeah. They're like, uh, maybe we should have done that originally. But um, yeah, it, you know, you, you could tell that after Friday night, after the win, Pierce was even setting, look, I got to go talk to Witt real quick. I got to make sure he's calm. And, you know, he understands the emotions of the game because he is an emotional guy. He's a competitor. Um but yeah, like you said, it, it felt inevitable, right? You got Tanner on the mound, and what a, what a story to have him come back and be able to provide what he has. Um, but yeah, I, I really like what we saw from Witt. You know, he obviously still is working on that fastball command, um, but it looked better than it has. Um, and then, you know, there was a couple of change-ups that looked just spectacular, and then the big 12-6 breaking ball where all the scouts were there, and they were like, yep, they, he just made a lot more money right there. Like, he still's got it. So... It, it was fun to see, um, you know, you could tell what it meant to him. He had been cheering on his team so much throughout the entire season and to be able to compete, be able to be in that moment. It, it meant the world to him for sure. Yeah, no, I mean, that was really cool. And it, it was, it's fun watching him navigate because we talked about it last week. He's just, he's such a pitcher. He's not just a thrower. Like he has really good feel and you know, he got in that jam. And if you watch, if you go rewatch that final, I bet that he had, he got behind in the count two one is facing a right-handed hitter. And he goes 2-1 changeup. That is not a pitch you see very often, you know, from a power righty with a with a 12-6 hammer curveball to a right-handed batter. You know, the hitter was not expecting the 2-1 changeup. He floats it in there for a strike, and then he comes back 3-2. You know the curveball's coming, and he just drops it right on the outside corner, completely froze the hitter. You know, he goes crazy. He's, he's pumping his fist. He's pointing at the Texas on his jersey. The crowd's into it. Um, but that was really cool to see because we talked about the velo is not all the way back yet, so... He's going to have to rely on that changeup. He's going to have to rely on that curveball. So to see him go to a 2-1 changeup to a righty in that spot, that was really cool to see and then come back just with the curveball in the zone. That was not surprising to see the result there. But, yeah, man, he's been so fun to watch. But uh, yeah. it was well, the offense. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. His feel on the mound, too, was really something to watch. You know, we, you and I talked about it in the middle of the game, but he sat there for a good 16 seconds on one of the batters and just waited. He's like, I'm going to let the clock go all the way down. I'm going to throw off your rhythm. I'm going to throw off your timing. You know, it's just that, that intrinsic, I am the, I am the presence on the mound. You know, he, he, he has it again and he, or still has it. He never left him, but he just knows how to pitch to your point. It's not just going up and throwing. So, and then people complain. They're like, well, he could have come back up for a fourth inning. And Pierce talked about after the game is like, look, he was on 44 pitches those were emotional pitches. This was an emotional game. It was, it was good to get mad out. And to your point, it was a clean time to go to the yep. pin at that point and, and let them start to work. So. 
Yeah, I mean, he was still able to increase his pitch count a little bit. So, I mean, it was still what it wasn't like, you know, he reduced his pitch count, which is not what you want this time of year. But yeah, no, I mean, I thought that made a lot of sense. Um, but the offense came through again, seven runs. It was a seven three victory for Texas. The offense all weekend, man. I mean, the one thing that uh, stood out to me as I was watching, and I was looking through the box scores uh, as we sat there on Saturday. This weekend, um, Jared Thomas, Peyton Powell, Dylan Campbell, in the first inning of the of the of the series in all three games, they were a combined nine for nine. So all three games for Texas on offense started off base hit, base hit, base hit. All three games, those guys were locked in, which means, of course, Dylan Campbell, his hit streak is now up to thirty three. He wasted no time. I mean, he he got the hit in the first inning of every game. He is completely locked in. Jared Thomas, I mean, he just, he can't look better. You know, Peyton Powell, his batting average is through the roof. The top of that order is is pretty absurd right now. But to see those guys come out and set the tone, I mean, Ben Hampton, you know, I mean, it was just, you could just see it coming from a mile away, right? Like they save Ben Hampton and then they announce after the loss on Friday, oh, we're going with Ben Hampton on Saturday. You just you could see it coming from a mile away. I'm not even a big karma guy, but it's like, is Ben Hampton really going to beat Tanner Witt with this awesome redemption story after you know everything Witt has been through? And then Ben Hampton, they saved him for this game on Saturday. It was like it doesn't feel like West Virginia is going to be able to pull this one off. And of course, Hampton, he just doesn't have it. They yank him in the first inning. Um, West Virginia bullpen holds it down pretty good, but it was it was just too little, too late, man. I can't hear you for some reason. Yeah, you you nailed it. Um, Hampton ended up going just a single out uh, in the first inning. He gave up three hits, four run, two earned. He walked two guys. Uh, they bring in Major Aiden, or Aiden Major, sorry. He only goes two innings, and he gives up six hits and two runs. And so it was just, Texas was on fire. I mean, at this point, you know, they're they're literally in flame mode, like NBA 2K, just launching from downtown, did not matter. Jared Thomas was three for five on the day. Jalen Flores had probably his best game as a hitter for Texas. The the home run that he launched to left field into the wind was, was just ridiculous. I mean, that, that was something it was like, Oh, that's what he looks like. That's why he was a first round, like kind of talent that came ended up at coming to Texas. So yeah, that on fire in Flago. Yeah, no Flores was awesome in that last game. It was really cool to see, you know, the freshman, come through there with Jared Thomas and Jalen Flores. I mean, obviously Thomas has been killing it for a couple months now, but to see Flores, you know, he's gotten this, he's gotten this longer leash lately. He's gotten a little bit more consistent playing time. And he came through on Saturday. He hit three balls like really hard. One of them was caught on just an amazing play in the outfield by West Virginia, but the other one went for a really solid RBI single. And then of course the home run to left field. So he looked incredible. Um, Great day for Jalen Flores. We'll see if he can, keep it up and, uh, you know, lengthen out the lineup a little bit there. But yeah, I mean, that was it. The celebration on the field was pretty cool. They went out, you know, they party with left field as they, as they tend to do with moments like that. Um, everyone was super hyped during the interviews, you know, Eric Kennedy, he said, this team has the look, um, Tanner Witt, you know, team feels better than ever. He's quoting, you know, he's quoting movies left and right. Um, just the vibes were good, man. It was, it was cool to see any other thoughts on the, the weekend overall, before we look ahead here. You know, the the play of the game might have been Dylan Campbell, though. J.J. Weatherholt hits a single through the right side, past O'Dowd, into the shift, right, and past um, Flores. D.C. just casually picks it up in right field and just fires a laser to Jared Thomas to get Weatherholt, who had made too big of a, a curve around first. And, dude, I mean, what a, what a talent, right, from a hitting perspective, a defensive perspective. He caught a ball this weekend. I can't remember if it was on Saturday. It might have been on Friday but a diving catch. He caught at least two up against the wall. Um, just a true, t- a true five tool player. Um, I think you had that marked down in the notes, but just yeah. that dude was special. It, it, it's been a lot of fun to see him just completely go bananas as we all know that he could do when the season started. So. I mean, if you catch him on the right day, he might go like all five tools within the same game. I mean, it would not be a shock if you go out to a Texas game and you see Dylan Campbell hit for a home run and then, you know, bunt for a single and then throw out a guy in the outfield and make a diving catch in the outfield and then steal two bases. I mean, yeah, I mean, he's absolutely a five tool player and he's just super fun to watch. He was the best player on the field all weekend, which is a, uh, you know, crazy to say when JJ Weatherholt was out there, but Dylan Campbell's awesome right now, man. There's just not many uh, players you would rather have heading into the postseason right now, but 
Zach, that is enough about the regular season. It's done. It is in the history books. We have to move forward. We have a Big 12 tournament to preview. We have regional stuff to talk about. Um, you want to talk about maybe the uh, the schedule here in in Arlington and what Texas, uh, you know, how the bracket kind of shook out? Yeah. Um, and then just one last note. You, you mentioned it's in the history. It literally is in the history books. No team has ever won the championship going in, needing to win all three games on the final day. And what does Texas do? Uh, they, they do, they do the thing. And what's crazy to think about is 2018, 2021, 2023, all three years that Texas won the title or those three years that Texas won the title, I should say, they all won on the very last day. So, you know, keeping up tradition, um, it's craziness, but yeah, going, going to the big 12 tournament, right. Texas is the number one overall seed due to tiebreaker rules. Everyone's like, how is that possible? Cause they lost to Oklahoma state. If you do the whole round Robin, Texas went four and two against West Virginia and Oklahoma state, Oklahoma state went three and three against West Virginia and Texas. And then, and then West Virginia went two and four against Texas and Oklahoma state. So it's so facto it's one, two, three, Texas, Oklahoma state, West Virginia. Um, they're going to be facing the number eight seed Kansas. Um, so not a tough, all right, I should say that is a very tough opponent. You know, there's no easy outs in the Big 12. Texas certainly had all they could handle up in Lawrence, and so they got to face them again. Um, but, yeah, Wednesday Wednesday at 1230, sharp. Well, or however long the first game goes, I guess, in the Big 12 tournament, they're going to face old Bumgarner again. Um, if Texas were to win that game, they'll play the winner of the TCU-Kansas State game, and that would be at – uh, what is it? 4 p.m. I believe on Thursday. So, yes, yeah. if they happen to lose Game One, unfortunately, you better you know bring bring some coffee because they'd be playing at 9 a.m. on Thursday, which no one wants. So breakfast ball, yeah, yeah breakfast ball. No one wants that. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it was funny too because when, when we were talking when you're uh, when we were talking about that tiebreaker, that was the scenario that I that I brought up on the pod last week when I was like. Okay, but we need to talk about the most fun scenario where Texas actually does sweep West Virginia and then Oklahoma State wins exactly two out of three because that would provide a three-way tie at the top. You know, that's not very likely, but that's the most fun scenario. So we should probably, you know, go look at how that would shake out. And then, of course, you know, we go look at it after the show ends and we're like, oh, Texas would actually win that. You know, that'd be crazy if that actually happens. And, of course, it just, like, happens, like, relatively <laughs> easily. So uh, <laughs> kind of funny how that works out. But, yeah, I mean, the Kansas game – um, you got the rematch, man. It's probably going to be Lucas Gordon against Colin Bumgarner. Um, you know, Kansas and Bumgarner got the better of them in in round one. You know, it's it's going to be tough to beat Lucas Gordon twice in that matchup. It's going to be hard for Bumgarner to replicate what he was able to do in that first game. Um, you remember the wind was blowing in quite a bit in that game. Texas did yeah. hit some balls pretty hard. Um, you know, what Bumgarner did that game, he just did a good job mixing up his pitches. He was using both sides of the plate. He was flicking in that slider for a strike pretty consistently. He just wasn't leaving that many mistake pitches over the heart of the plate. That's going to be hard to replicate again, man, because it's, it's a fine line between, um, you know, not walking people, but also not leaving balls over the heart of the plate. And just the way the Texas lineup is hitting right now, you know, kind of one through nine pretty much. It's going to be really hard for him to replicate that performance. So, yeah, I mean... You know, it's 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 number one versus number eight. You got to feel pretty good about Texas in that first in that first game. Yeah, and you got to feel good about the bracket in general, right? Yeah. By, by getting that number one seed, um, Texas has obviously Kansas, TCU, and K State on their side of the bracket, whereas Oklahoma State, Oklahoma, West Virginia, and Texas Tech are all on the other side. And that, to me, that's just a beating, right? Like, there's no easy way to navigate through that. And you know, whereas Texas has won the series against Kansas, they've won the series against TCU and they won the series against K-State. So they've had some success. Um, and, you know, you look at the way Oklahoma State's playing right now, they're they're playing really, really well. You look at what Oklahoma's doing right now and have recently, they've been playing really well. So, um, you know, you in some ways, you got to feel really good about the bracket and the draw that Texas got by getting that number one overall seed. Um, the, the other thing to mention is, the, the Horns can't afford to lose game one. Um, we've seen this in the past five times that Texas has been the number one seed. So 2021, 2018, 2011, 2010, and 2009, Texas entered the Big 12 tournament as the number one seed, and they lost the first game in every single one of those. Uh, so losing does not bode well for Texas. 
because the only time they actually won the title in any of those, I think, was 2009. So, yeah, they, they're going to have to, you know, rewrite a little bit of history there because they have not been good as the number one seed going into that, that first game. Yeah, I mean, hopefully all the bats that heated up on the homestand are able to stay hot there because, you know, that'll be the key overall. Um, yeah, I mean, that 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 is pretty much uh, how the Kansas game is going to shake out. I definitely agree with you that the other side of the bracket is the more intimidating side with, you know, Oklahoma State playing really good. West Virginia is going to have something to prove now. Um, they're on the outside looking in from the hosting perspective. And then you've got Oklahoma, who is uh, squarely on the bubble, so they've got a lot to play for there. So, um Zach, let's get into the hosting stuff. It's it's what the people want to hear about. They want to know if they will be able to see some postseason baseball at the dish. Um, D1baseball.com, they came out with the regional projections. They just said uh, they snuck the Longhorns in there at number 16. Zach, they said, you know what? We, you know, they went 3-0. They won the Big 12. Let's sneak them in there at 16. Let's send the Aggies down there to Austin. You know, a little bit of DBU. Drop them down to the two line, send them to Austin. Looks pretty nice on paper to me. Uh, I don't know, man. I think it's uh, – what What does Texas need to do, do you think, to make this a reality this week? And I've got my opinion. I've kind of got my thoughts. Um, if you, What do you think needs to happen for this Austin Regional to you know be a reality? I think a couple of things, right? One, right now it shows three teams that realistically have the chance to host a regional. If you look at all the matchups, the Texas, te- uh, the Texas sweep over West Virginia looks better than their series loss to Oklahoma State, and it looks better than West Virginia's series win over Oklahoma State. So if you look at it from that perspective, you give them a little more credence to, hey, Texas is is that much a little bit better than the other two. Um, That said, looking at RPI, still at 23, it's right there on that edge. You know, really top 20 is what you want to see. I think they need to win too. I think they need to beat Kansas. I think they need to beat the winner of the West Virginia, or uh, sorry, the TCU versus K-State game. After that, I think everything's kind of gravy. I mean, that's, they win two, they're going to be 41 and 18. Well, 41 and 19, I guess, if they were to, you know, eventually get dumped out. Um, but they'd, they'd be at 41 wins. They'd have a probably borderline top 20 RPI. And I think that's enough. Now, what could be an issue is if Oklahoma State and West Virginia both end up in the semifinal on the bottom side. That, that would be bad news for Texas, right? Um, I think it then comes down to maybe money, maybe the size and the draw of the crowd. Do they get the TV ratings by bringing Texas and A&M into the same regional, right? So, you know, there's a, some other factors that play into that. Plus, what we saw last year in the Big 12 tournament was the tournament really didn't matter a ton. So yeah, yeah. maybe the tournament committee looks at those first two games, and if they see Texas win, they're like, okay, cool, got it, click the button. And they, they just completely ignore. I don't know that they can do that this year, though, because seven of the eight teams have something to play for. If Texas Tech goes 0-2, they're likely not making the tournament. Same thing with Oklahoma, same thing with TCU, same thing with Kansas State. And so um, I, I feel good if they get two wins. If they get three wins, I think it's an automatic lock. They're, they're, a, they're a host. Yeah, no, I mean, that's where I was at. I was thinking you win two, you go in there, you win two games, you're probably going to end up being a host. I think if you win one game, you you still have a sweat. I mean, it'll obviously depend on how a lot of different games across the country shake out. But, yeah. um, you know, win one game, you still you still have a sweat. Two games, I I think, you know, I agree with you that I just, the NCAA, man, it's just, it's not a stand-up organization. You know, it's, they, they want to make as much money as possible. I mean, it's, if they can give, if it, if Texas is on the bubble and they can give, you know, Austin a regional and, and sneak them in there and, you know, they know they're going to pack the place. They know, you know, the ticket prices will be up and it's still going to be packed regardless. You can send A&M there, which would, of course, you know, just times all that by three. Um, I just, I think if Texas does end up on the bubble, the NCAA, you know, I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's, it's all money at the end of the day and they're going to give Texas, you know, they've got the facilities They've got the, you know, they've got the big Longhorn in center field. You know, it, it looks good on TV. I mean, you know, people people know how it works. So we'll see how it plays out. But it's definitely interesting just with how many Big 12 teams really have something to play for. I mean, two of the other, two of the main teams that Texas is competing against, like we talked about for that hosting spot is Oklahoma State. And then like if West Virginia were to climb back into it by going on a run. So them both being on the opposite side of the bracket is very interesting. So yeah, um, what I did here is I wanted to jot down a little bit of a cheat sheet um, for, 
you know, the Big 12 tournament is not the only tournament going on this week. There's going to be a ton of college baseball on. Um, pretty much everyone besides the SEC will be playing this weekend because the SEC refuses to play their tournament indoors. So I, uh, <laughs> instead of playing baseball, they just sit in the rain like a, like a bunch of like a bunch of sad men. Um, but you know, besides the SEC, everyone else is going to be playing baseball. You know, maybe SEC if they're lucky enough, they can play two or three innings here or there. Um, they just need to play that tournament indoors somewhere. It just seems a, a weird. tradition like unlike any other. Uh, it really the, is a tradition unlike any in, other. But Vanderbilt, Florida is going to end up being a, a reality. <laughs> yeah, it's like you get to Sunday and it's like, all right. Here's the last game of the second round between Arkansas and, and Vandy. Like, it's just like, what are they doing? It's like the SEC is the best baseball conference. They've got all these great players, all these great teams. You put them in a double, like you put them in an elimination format. You should just get all these awesome games left and right. And it's like, all right, let's go watch uh, Florida and, and Vanderbilt play three innings. And then we'll check back in like nine hours later and it'll still be raining. But yeah, I don't know why they can't play that indoors. It's kind of ridiculous, but nonetheless, if you are a Texas fan hoping to see regional baseball in Austin, here's who you should be rooting against across the country. Boston college. They are the number 15 overall seed right now. This is all the, the most recent regional projections by D one baseball.com. Boston college is a 15 seed overall right now. RPI of 15, Alabama, 14 overall seed right now um, with an RPI of 12. We mentioned Oklahoma State. They're at 13 right now, um, RPI of 20. West Virginia is projected to be a two seed um, in a regional right now, so they're not projected to host. RPI of 24 right behind Texas at 23. You've got Dallas Baptist as the two seed in the Austin regional. They've got an RPI of 14, so they're potentially a bubble team that could sneak up on that one line. Tennessee, they're projected as a as a non-host right now, as a two seed in a regional. But if they go on a crazy run in Hoover, if they are able to get some games in, they're a team to watch out for. So root against Tennessee. Same thing with Campbell. They put in a bid to host at you know some random stadium because they can't actually host at their stadium. But they're on the border. They're they're a non-host right now. Twenty one RPI. You've got UConn, twenty five RPI. Auburn, number twelve overall right now, but they're kind of shaky. Um, they have a thirteen RPI, but you know, if Auburn were to really slip up in Hoover, they could drop out. You've got East Carolina, you know, they're a non-host right now. So those are a bunch of teams, Zach, you can add on anything else you'd like to add on there. But yeah, I mean, Boston College, Alabama, Oklahoma State, West Virginia, DBU, Tennessee, Campbell, UConn, Auburn. Those are kind of the teams that uh, team uh, Texas fans should be locked in on this weekend. Just if you, if you want to have just have a little bit of an extra sweat. Yeah, for sure. I, I think, you know, realistically, um, the teams you have to sweat the most are a, a Dallas Baptist or an East Carolina or even like an, a West Virginia jumping Texas, right? By going far, winning their conference. Tennessee, it feels like they're probably going to need to go really, really far, like win the SEC to host. Um, they just, they don't have the conference record. Campbell, I feel like they're right there. I don't think they're going to get back into the hosting. I think they're going to be squarely a two seed. Um, same thing with DBU to some extent, I, I mean, even though they have the high RPI, like their conference just isn't that great this season. And so there's not a lot of opportunity for them to increase that RPI. Uh, and, and UConn's the other one. They've, they've slipped up a little bit. I feel like they probably lost their, their chance. So, yeah, I mean, you would hope that Alabama just completely whiffs it. You know, maybe Bohannon can bet on them the money line or something. I don't know. And that Hoover. Um, Auburn's another one who's a very dangerous team, but they're very apt to go drop game one against like um, Georgia or Missouri or whoever they're playing. I don't even haven't looked at the rulings, but it's not going to matter. They're not actually going to play. They're (laughs) they're just going to sit in the clubhouse. (laughs) But yeah, so I, that's a very strong list of, you know, get out your voodoo dolls and start waving some magic wands and whatever else you do. So. Yeah. yeah, I mean the odds are if if you if you turn on your television at some point this week, there will be a game that matters for Texas that you can <laughs> yeah. pick a team to root for and be invested in, which is just really fun to do because you know if you're if you're working from home, if you're at work just trying to track games off to the side, there's going to be important games all weekend long, which is just what happens when uh, you're on the bubble of the you know 15 to 20 range. And I will say, we we say Texas needs to win two games, maybe just one. Texas, it would be good to win as many games as possible. I mean, I know that's kind of like, you know, obvious, you know, thanks Aaron for pointing that out, but the higher they can get, I think it really would be helpful this year because 
if you can get up into like the 11 or the 12 range, or maybe even like number 10 overall, it would be nice to be able to avoid a Wake Forest or an Arkansas or a Florida in a potential super regional matchup. I know that's pretty far down the line, but it feels like there's like five or six pretty good teams right now that would be favored over Texas for sure. Not that Texas couldn't beat them, but like it would be tough matchups on the road to go in there and win a super regional. But if Texas is able to creep up to number 11 overall, number 10 overall, then you're potentially looking at a super regional matchup where Texas, you know, might even, you know, be the favorite on the road with the way they're playing. So it would, it would be pretty important for Texas to go on a run here and creep up, you know, not just to host, but maybe get into that 10, 11, 12 range and not just be like a 15 or 16 waiting to play Wake Forest or LSU if they are to somehow get through. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And another kind of just add on to that is people have asked, well, could they be a super regional host? I don't think so, right? Like if you look at the top eight right now, there's no movement. It's there's seven teams that are firmly locked into those top eight. And then you got Virginia at number eight, who, I mean, they'd really have to go Owen two or whatever that weird ACC round Robin pool thing is that they do. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, that they would have to do really poorly in order for Texas to be able to have even a remote shot. And I, I told someone else earlier, things would have to line up so perfectly. I mean, the stars would have to align and you're like, Oh, this is a championship season because everything would mount up so perfectly for Texas to get that top eight seed. So I just don't yeah. see it as a possibility. All right. Well, let's talk about how that could potentially happen where Texas could go on a run here and, uh, you know, climb up that ranking. So of course we have the Texas side of the bracket. We've already talked about it. Texas and Kansas is the one eight TCU, Kansas state is the four five. Those four teams will basically play a mini regional little double elimination. The winner of that gets to the championship game on Sunday, which is just, just winner take all right for that game on Sunday. Yep. yep. And then the bottom half of the bracket, we've got number two seed Oklahoma State against number seven Oklahoma, West Virginia versus Texas Tech. We mentioned Oklahoma and Texas Tech, both kind of on the bubble. Oklahoma State, West Virginia, both on the bubble of hosting. So those games will be very important. Excited to see how all of those play out. Zach, it's prediction time. Who do you think is coming out of the top half of the bracket? Who do you think is coming out of the bottom half of the bracket? And then it's tough to predict at that point who has the pitching left and whatnot, but you know, just so we can put our names on it, how do you see this uh, shaking out overall? I think I'm going to stick with, uh, with my original projections from the beginning of the season, uh, oh. Oklahoma state over TCU in the final game. I, you know, it's not that I think TCU is better than Texas. I actually don't think they are. Um, I think they might have a little bit more bullpen depth at this juncture than Texas does. Um, you know, one of the, the caveats to Tanner Witt being that third guy is you're not going to get three, four innings or more than three or four innings out of him, right? You're going to have to go into your bullpen and potentially reach deep. And so it just feels like Texas could potentially run out of run out of real estate with their bullpen. And they, I see him getting to the semifinals, but I'm not sure they can win, you know, four games to get to that championship game. Yeah. So I, I think that's interesting. I'm going with Texas to win the whole thing over Oklahoma state. Um, I, 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 I feel pretty good about Texas coming out of their half of the regional. And then the bottom half is total chaos. I feel pretty good about Oklahoma state with just the way they're playing right now and kind of their pitching depth and their bullpen. Um, I just think with Texas right now, I think they're in a good position to win game one. I think when you get TCU or Kansas state on the mound against LBJ in game two, I think Texas is in a really good spot there just with the way they're hitting and the bats are coming along and the way LBJ has been pitching with Lucas Gordon. So I think they have a really good chance to start two and O and then you think, you know, they'll have the day off on Friday. So then they'll play Saturday in that third game. And in, in this scenario, you've got Tanner Witt for, you know, four innings potentially then Travis Staley against a team that has already used more pitching, you know, either probably TCU or Kansas state, whoever makes its way back there. I just think Texas has a good chance to start three and O and then I feel like Oklahoma state's coming out of the bottom half with just, I just think they're the best team in the bottom half. And I think it'll work itself out that way. When you get to Sunday in a one game winner take all between Texas and Oklahoma state, I, I don't have a strong opinion there. It'd be hard for me to really project at this point, but man, I've just, I think the offense is so hot right now for Texas and the starting pitching has been so good. I just, I don't really see a good reason to pick against Texas right now, just with the way the draw shook out. I mean, if it had shaken out the other way where, you know, Texas has to deal with Braden Carmichael in game one, and then you got Texas Tech and Gavin Cash lurking there, and then Oklahoma State. But 
just with the way it worked out with the top half of the bracket and the bottom half of the bracket, I, I think it set up pretty well for Texas. Uh, we'll see how it plays out. But yeah, I'll go Texas over Oklahoma State. Um, it will definitely, yeah. it's going to be fun. There's gonna, there's so much at stake in Arlington. So it's it's going to be an awesome sure. week. You know, then things that considers Globe Life plays pretty big, which I think yeah. plays somewhat to Texas' advantage. They can't, it's not just going to be a launching pad for folks like Texas Tech, as an example, who are used to playing in Lubbock. Um, but Texas does a really good job of spraying the ball over the field. They're not a, you know, purely pull side team or it, so it, it does set up really well for the offense. Um, you know, you, you got to worry a little bit about Porter Brown's defense out in left field. He didn't have the strongest of defensive um, games against uh, the teams, but again, that was the very first three games of the season. So he's come light years defensively since then. So I, I don't see it as a huge, um, huge issue, but I also like the fact that Texas has played three games there again. You know, we saw this before back in what, 2021, where Texas did really poorly in Arlington to start the season and come back and they end up, you know, doing really well. So it'll be interesting to see what they, what they're able to come with. I know they're playing with a lot of swagger, you know, that they really want it. I think Pierce has them in a good position where they understand, Hey, look, the championship isn't enough, right? We still have some work to do. So I think they're going to want to revenge against Baumgartner on, on Wednesday, you know, uh, Lucas Gordon is definitely going to have a little chip on his shoulder, which as we've seen, he has the ability to adjust pretty much on the fly. So that doesn't bode well for Kansas in many aspects, but, uh, yeah, it'll be, it should be a really exciting big 12 tournament. Cause like I said, seven of the eight teams really have something to play for Kansas. I mean, yes, they have something to play for. They need to win it all in order to get in the, in the tournament, which I just don't see happening, but the other seven teams are, you know, they they're really scratching clawing at this point. Yeah, which is why Texas it they they definitely been playing with a chip on their shoulder and they need to keep it that way because ever since that San Jose State loss and then uh West Virginia shaking up the rotation, both of those things really, you know, they they really fired this team up and you know, it's a little different now, you know, they're coming off a lot of success, they're on like a five game win streak. Um, you know, they're they're Big 12 champs. Um can they come in and still play with that same fire? I think that's going to be the key. And if they do that, the defense has been really good. They've been pretty good on the bases. Offense is on fire. The rotation's there. I mean, we didn't even really talk about the bullpen, but I mean, Zane Morehouse was better. Charlie Hurley got the final out on Saturday. Um, Ace Whitehead's coming in throwing strikes. So, you know, the bullpen, it's not the best bullpen we've ever seen, but the guys are starting to improve. There's been less walks here and there. So they're playing pretty good baseball. Um, it'll definitely be fun to watch. Um, Follow us on Twitter. We will be updating not just Texas games, but we will be giving results of all the games in Arlington and around the country and who you need to be rooting for and those results there. So uh, you can find me at Aaron Little OB on Twitter. You can find Zach at Zach at the Dish. You can also find um, all of that we just talked about, plus a lot of written content on orangebloods.com. Nice little site that has some information about University of Texas sports. Uh, we've got game threads. I will have... Probably quick recaps um, because it is conference tournament week. And I don't know if I'll be writing about two games or about like six games. So, uh, so we gotta, we gotta pace ourselves a little bit, but I'll have recaps. Zach will have the game day threads. We'll have quotes. We'll have highlights. We will have um, updates on RPI and all the other things going around the country. You know, maybe we might even get to give like an update on an SEC score at some point, if we're lucky, probably not, but you know, maybe, maybe they'll play a couple innings. Uh, we'll see. Uh, but yeah, I mean, check out, check us out on orangebloods.com. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can subscribe to the channel, like the show, Spotify, you know, follow the podcast, um, rate and review the podcast. Same thing on Apple podcasts, um, you know, share it with your friends. It's college baseball. This is a good time. If you got a buddy that doesn't watch too much college baseball, bring them in. This is the time to do it. This is the best time of year. You've got kids, you know, their childhoods are on the line. They might not get to play baseball anymore. They're leaving it all on the field. Um, you know, you've got crazy walk-offs, you've got bat flips, you've got pitchers throwing 150 pitches before they take a job in an accounting firm. I mean, this is the best time of year to be a college baseball fan. So introduce them to this show, um, get them on Orange Bloods. But yeah, I mean, Zach, you got anything else before we uh, get out of here and watch college baseball for like eight straight days in a row? No, it's the best time of year. Um, we're, we're one week away from regionals and I'm here for it. That That's the favorite time of the year. It's going to be nuts. Uh, excited. I'll be up in Arlington. So if you're in Arlington, give me a shout. 
you'll probably see me wandering around and taking photos and just, you know, tomfoolery in general at Texas Live. So looking forward to it. Sounds like a plan. All right. Well, uh, that'll do it for the show this week. We will, of course, be back next week. We will have the bracket. We'll be making picks. We will be breaking down so many different scenarios and pitchers and hitters and talking about, you know, all kinds of stats. It is next week's show is definitely going to be, uh, you know, probably my favorite of the year. It's going to be a lot of fun previewing the regional wherever Texas does end up. But uh, yeah, with that, everyone enjoy the games and uh, have a good week. Welcome. Subscribe, Subscribe to the channel. <laughs> Do it now.